How are you doing? I am Bonnie Morris. I'm the author of this book, Big and Strong, I Belong. And the illustrator or artist is Linda Oliver. So I'm going to read this for you and I hope you dig it. Big and Strong, I Belong. Sarah is a little girl who's big. One day, her best friend, Anne, called her a pig. No one likes to have their feelings hurt. Sarah hid her face inside her shirt. Anne, you hurt my feelings, Sarah cried. I'm bigger, but I'm made like you inside. The next day, everyone played basketball, and Anne made lots of baskets. Anne is tall. When Sarah said, wow, I can't score like that, Anne told Sarah, it's because you're fat. Well. That's when Sarah's teacher stopped the game. And she said, inside we're all the same. We all have bones and bellies, skin and hair, and calling names that hurt just isn't fair. When we grow up, our bodies start to change. Some bodies end up big and that's not strange. All of us, big or thin or short or long, can find a place in dance, art, sports, or song. Some girls are big and strong. That's how they grow. And then the teacher gave them a new rule. It's not okay to tease your friends at school. Sarah went home happier that day. She knew she'd find just the right words to say. She made them rhyme and soon she had a song. I'm me, I'm big and strong, and I belong. Remember, you are big and strong and you belong. Hi, my name is Lisa Gammon Olson, and I am going to read you one of the books that I have written called And the Trees Began to Move. It was um, written by myself, Lisa Gammon Olson, and it was illustrated by Lauren Rutledge. So I'll try to show you the pictures as we go along. The spirit of the pond, a vain and selfish entity, wants to preserve his beauty by denying the ancient tree spirits his life-giving water in a time of drought. He discovers that in trying to save himself, he will lose everything that he holds dear. Deep within the forest, the spirits of all nature once dwelled in peace and harmony. The cool, deep pool at the center of the woods was the heart and soul of the forest, or so the spirit of the pond thought. The crystal clear water of the pool shimmered in the sunlight. The branches of the gnarled willow and stately oak trees hung out over the water and dappled the pool with wonderful leafy shadows that moved gently with the breeze. Small silver fishes and glistening green frogs gathered in the shadowed coolness near the water's edge. I am so beautiful, the pond spirit told himself. The sun sparkles so brightly off my surface, it surely must dazzle all who look upon me. The spirit of the pond loved the way the trees, bushes, and wildflowers reflected their colorful brilliance in his surface. He marveled how he could be no color at all, yet to be appear to be all colors at once, always changing his reflection 
to mirror his surroundings. Perfection reigned until a drought came and the rain ceased to fall. The spirit of the pond settled down deep in the cool depths to await the storms which were sure to come. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and still no rain fell on the magical forest. The spirits of all living forest creatures became anxious. I am growing weak, the grandfather of all oaks moaned. My leaves are dropping from the lack of rain. He shuddered and his drooping branches rasped and hissed sharply. My bark is becoming thin and brittle in the heat, the great willow said, solemnly shaking his massive head of leaves. He shifted his roots in the hard, dry earth. We all need to get closer to the water. He inched his massive trunk closer to the cool banks of the pool. The pine trees whispered together in agreement, and with much creaking and cracking, they strained to pull their roots free from the solid ground. Branches swayed and quivered, and leaves rained down in a dry shower of green as the ancient trees closed in on the pond. Ah, said the mountain ash as he wriggled his roots deep into the soft, muddy bank. That feels wonderful. We should have thought of this weeks ago, a honey locust agreed, extending a tendril of root into the healing water of the pond. I believe I'll have a nice long drink of this cool, refreshing water. Grandfather Oak nodded in agreement and sighs of contentment circled the pond as the great trees quenched their thirst. They drank and drank and drank. The spirit of the pond awoke from his slumber. Something was different. Something was not right. The surface of the pond didn't twinkle and sparkle above him. The cascading rush of the waterfall was a mere whisper in his ears. What had happened while he slept? He swirled to the surface in a panicky froth of bubbles and foam. What catastrophe has befallen us, he cried aloud. Look, the water level has fallen. Boulders and logs, which were submerged only yesterday, are now dry as old bones. He ranted and raved as he circled the pond. You trees, he screeched. You trees are stealing my precious water and blocking the sunlight with your branches. My sparkle is gone. You are all too close. The pond lies in shadow and my beautiful colors are dark and stained. You have no right to steal what is mine. We surely meant no harm, Grandfather Oak apologized, but we will all perish without water and you have much to spare. I care not what happens to you, the pond spirit replied angrily. I don't help myself to your treasures, do I? Your fruit and seeds are yours to give as you choose, are they not? I will do as I please with what belongs to me. We allow choose to allow those with need to help themselves, the great willow argued. The birds and squirrels needn't ask for what they need. We are all one in spirit, and we will share what we have. And I will keep what is mine, the pond spirit said coldly. Now go. The trees shook their shaggy heads sadly, but pulled their roots from the moist earth near the pond. The ground trembled and shook as they slowly backed away. Ah, that's better. The pond spirit whispered to himself as the trees receded and the sun could once again sparkle and dance across his surface. Another month passed without rain before the spirit of the pond began to worry. With no trees close to provide shade from the scorching sun, the temperature of the water began to rise. Warmth-loving algae grew profusely and stained the water with a distinctive emerald tint. The glistening green frogs and the small silver fishes that loved to dart in and out of the shadows near the edge of the pond didn't tolerate the changing conditions. The smell of decay was thick. I have been very foolish, the spirit of the pond cried. In trying to save myself, I have indeed lost all I hold dear. I have turned my back on the very ones who have sustained me all these years. The brackish water boiled and churned in his anguish. Grandfather Oak, he called. Mighty Willow, forgive my foolish ignorance. I have been vain and very, very selfish. 
Bring your brothers and sisters back to the pond, and I will gladly share my treasures with you. I will nourish and restore you, and in exchange will restore myself. For without each other, we are nothing. Silence greeted his plea. He heaved a mighty sigh and prepared to sink down into the murky depths to await his self-inflicted doom. The water rippled once and then again. The spirit heard a muffled crack, crack. The earth vibrated ever so faintly at first. Then the sounds grew ever louder, ever closer. His heart soared. Grandfather Oak had heard. Snap, thud, crick, crack. The clearing around the pool exploded with sound as the trees began to move. And as the last tree returned to its rightful place near the pond, the magic was restored and they could once again live together in peace and harmony. In the circle of life, we are all dependent upon the actions and kindness of others. Together, we thrive. I hope you enjoyed and the trees began to move. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Richard Copley, and I'm going to read a story I wrote in a book published by Ifrig Publishing, Kenny and the Blue Sky, illustrated by Jane Ramsey. And this is the cover. Kenny and the Blue Sky by Richard Copley, illustrated by Jane Ramsey. One fine spring morning, Kenny sat very still on his back steps and gazed up at the blue sky. Kenny loved the blue sky. The night sky was a little scary, and the gray sky was a little sad. But the blue sky was safe and cheerful and friendly. A few puffy white clouds drifted across the sky with ease. Kenny sat very still. He sat very still and wished he could be in the blue sky. The clouds drifted on. Kenny looked around the backyard of the garden apartments. At the playground, Miriam and Francis were swinging, and Joey was climbing up the steps of the big slide. Joey's little brother was playing in the sandbox, patting a mountain into shape and nearby Kenny's parents were sitting on beach chairs watching his sister Karen in her playpen. Kenny stood up to go play with his sister. It was then that he glanced at the sky and noticed a slight movement, barely a tremble, not quite a quiver. He kept watching, thinking that something was about to happen. And then Kenny saw what no one else saw. Slowly, ever so slowly, the blue sky lowered itself. Kenny stared. He was amazed and pleased. He called to his parents, Ma! Dad! and pointed at the blue sky as it slid through the upper air. Kenny's parents looked up, looked at each other in surprise, and looked up again. Kenny's sister Karen held on to the bars of her playpen and looked up. All the children stopped their playing and looked up. Slowly, 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 the blue sky fell through the great space above. Everyone waited. The sky fell farther and farther. After a long while, the sky fell to a place just above Kenny's backyard. As the blue overtook treetops and rooftops, the wondering children began to shout with excitement. Miriam and Francis swung in and out of the blue. Joey stood proudly at the top of the big slide, covered by the blue. Joey's little brother made little jumps from the top of his mountain, and Kenny picked up his sister from her playpen and held her high. Her stubby fingers wiggled in the air. Steadily, the blue sky fell the last few feet. Gently, quietly, it met the earth. The children became still. No one uttered a sound. Miriam and Francis and Joey and Joey's little brother and Kenny and Kenny's sister 
and Kenny's mom and dad were in the blue sky. Kenny looked down. The dandelions were green. Kenny placed his sister in his mother's arms and breathed deeply. The blue tickled his nose at first, but he soon became used to its freshness and coolness, and he liked its faint scent of vanilla. Kenny looked through the vivid air. The children were exploring the blue, running, jumping, spinning. Their cries of delight seemed to come from a far distance. Kenny rushed through the sky with a band. Kenny whizzed and he whooped. He whirled and he tumbled. He rolled and rolled over and over in the cool grass with the other children. There was great gladness in the blue sky in Kenny's backyard, gladness upon gladness. Soon all the children lay on their backs, panting, laughing, waiting for everything to stop turning. They rested in the blue, and everything was still. Then they arose and felt a cool breeze against their skin and they beheld with growing pleasure splendid white clouds, clouds of glory, drifting softly over the garden apartments. The clouds eased lower and settled lightly in the blue sky in Kenny's backyard. Kenny and the others sped through the blue to the nearest cloud. They paused at the edge of the lofty vapor, and they stepped in. Inside was a gorgeous place, Hanging above and all around were veils of white mist and fantastic swirls and shreds and wisps. Deep within lay billows of thick whiteness, and motion throughout was smooth and slow. Kenny watched a white tuft turning gracefully. With a short, quick breath, he blew it to Joey, who blew it to his little brother, who blew it to Miriam, who blew it to Francis, and so the cloud full of children began to play. First, there was the blowing and pushing and fanning of the white fluff and streamers. Next came a short game of tag and another of hide-and-go-seek. Then came the somersaulting and leapfrogging and a very proper make-believe cloud picnic. After a while, a breeze came up and the cloud drifted on. The children jumped up and ran with the cloud, trying to stay inside. But the breeze increased, and all the clouds rose in the blue sky in Kenny's backyard and grandly trailed away. The children watched with longing until the clouds could no longer be seen. Then they walked back slowly into the cool breeze. And the breeze blew into a wind, and the wind into powerful gusts, and the boys and the girls were whisked from the ground and tossed and tussled and rumpled about in the blue. They were skyborn. The children were astonished, then afraid, then thrilled. In the midst of the blue sky above Kenny's backyard, they shrieked and squealed and called to each other with joy. Kenny joined in the clamor loudly, happily, as he was bounced and whiffled around with the others in the hilarious sky. And he thought that this all seemed so strangely familiar, like a long-forgotten dream, or lullaby, only better. And then the gusts diminished, and the wind became a cradling breeze, and the children were wafted down, down through the sky, and set down in the blue backyard. They wobbled, then steadied in a hush. They looked up to see where they'd been. Then they stared to each other, turned to each other and burst into story about the cloud and the wind and the flight through the blue. As the story went on, Kenny glanced around the backyard and noticed a slight stirring. He knew that the time had come. The children quieted, and then they all saw what they'd known all along they would see. Slowly, ever so slowly, the blue sky lifted itself. Kenny watched as the blue arose from the earth and climbed above shoulders and heads, and he stretched and he jumped and he reached with the others, but the blue rose higher yet. So the girls dashed back to the waiting swings and swung up to the rising sky, and Joey dashed back to the top of the slide and stood once again in the blue. But in moments, the sky cleared the swings and the slide, 
and rose higher up, out of reach. They descended past rooftops and treetops, through the place above Kenny's backyard, towards the great space above and the far upper air. Then Kenny called out, Come back! And Miriam and Francis and Joey and Joey's little brother called with Kenny, Come back! Come back! Come back! Come back! And the children waited. They stared up in silence. The sky rose a little, then stopped. It hung in midair, unmoving. This is it, Kenny thought, as he held his breath and watched, watching for all time. High above Kenny's backyard, the blue sky dipped. It dipped, then suddenly plunged. The children gasped, then cheered. The sky hurried closer and closer, filled the lower air, and coolly pressed itself against the earth. Kenny felt the, the cool rush and breathed the sweet vanilla, and with great love, he hugged the blue sky. The sky held to the earth for a long moment. The children ran through the blue, shouting jubilantly. Then the sky rose. It rose quickly, and the children became still. No one uttered a sound. The sky slowed and hovered over Kenny's backyard. Then it climbed, sure and fast, to its place in the upper air. Kenny followed its rapid ascent. Then he looked down. The dandelions were yellow. The children called again, come back. But this time the sky did not return. The children grew restless. They began to look at each other and shake their heads. There was some murmuring and shrugging of shoulders. Finally, Joey's little brother sighed, I'm going home. And Joey and Miriam and Francis agreed, me too. Tired but smiling, the children said their goodbyes and wandered home. Kenny was alone. A few puffy clouds appeared and drifted across the blue sky. Kenny lingered a moment in the bright backyard, and then he too wandered home. Kenny's mom and dad had seen everything. They didn't speak. Their happiness was in their eyes. As Kenny approached, his mother lightly touched his cheek, and his father placed a hand upon his shoulder. Kenny looked up at his parents and felt a little shy, a little shy and somehow more himself than he had ever been. He held their hands tightly. Then Kenny walked to the playpen where his sister Karen lay sleeping. He crouched down, reached between the bars, and stroked her damp hair. He wondered what she had seen and whether she would remember, and he thought that one day he would tell her the whole story. Then he stood up. His mother drew near, scooped up his sleeping sister, and carried her inside for the rest of her nap. His father followed to make lunch. The screen door banged shut. Kenny sat down on his back steps and gazed up at the blue sky. The blue sky was safe and cheerful and friendly, and it had a lived-in look. Kenny spoke in his mind to the blue sky. Thank you, he said. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will always remember what happened today. And he paused. He imagined himself grown up and still remembering. And he added, if you ever come back, I'll be waiting. Ian, I hope you like my story. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Patty Costello. I'm the author of Catalina and the King's Wall. I was inspired to write this book when I was at the Women's March in 2016 with my then one-year-old son. I was worried about the message he would be getting with the advent of the new administration. Therefore, I was inspired to do something, and the book is a result of being inspired. I hope you enjoy. Catalina in the King's Wall, written by Patty Costello, illustrated by Diana Kojokaru. In a not-so-far-away kingdom, not so long ago, there lived a girl named Catalina. 
Catalina created delicious delicacies for the king, but she really missed her family in the nearby kingdom. Catalina hummed happily while she baked and buttered from the crack of dawn until the darkness of night. There was no time to visit her family in the nearby kingdom, but they were coming to see her soon. One day, Catalina brought the king her bite-sized cookies bursting with butterscotch. She overheard him say, I do not like the people in the nearby kingdom. They are different. I must build a wall to keep them out. Oh no, Catalina said to herself. That means I'll never see my family. I've got to do something. Catalina browned and blended while she plotted a plan. Meanwhile, the king could not be pleased, not even in his playroom. This cookie needs more chocolate. Where's my milk? I want marshmallows, he bellowed. Oh boy, thought Catalina, he really frosts my cookies. Despite his ranting, the king ate and ate and ate her cookies. The next time Catalina came with her crunchy crinkle cookies, she had a plan for the king who clearly had no plan of his own. I have something you can use to build your wall. It will be easy as pie. Catalina lugged over a giant vat of her brother's favorite icing. The king's workers built an ooey and gooey wall. But soon the rain came. It rushed and gushed, and the icing drooped, drizzled, and dripped all over the kingdom. Catalina smiled. She knew that would happen. The king scowled. Build me a new wall immediately, he ordered his workers. Catalina persisted. I have something else you can use to build your wall. She dragged over a wagon filled with her father's favorite sprinkles. A wall made of sprinkles? The king asked suspiciously. It'll be a piece of cake, replied Catalina. The workers built a spectacularly speckled wall. But soon the wind began to blow. It growled and howled and the sprinkle swirled, swooshed and swished away. Catalina smiled. She knew that would happen. The king's face turned from orange to red. He demanded, I need a wall that will last forever. Oh, for goodness bakes, Catalina said to herself, what shall I do? Catalina thought and thought. Then her face lit up. I've got the recipe for success. She mixed up a huge bowl of her mother's favorite cookie dough. This is the cherry on top, she said to herself. The king took some convincing, but finally agreed. The workers built a gigantic cookie dough wall. Catalina trembled with trepidation. I hope this works. A fierce storm was brewing while the king inspected the new wall. Finally, an indestructible wall, he roared over the wind and rain. Catalina frowned. She did not know that would happen. This wall is never going to fall down. Catalina cried. She missed her family more than ever. Inconceivable! A chunk of dough blew off and hit the king on the head. Catalina had an idea. Why don't you take a bit of a bite? She slyly suggested. The king took a nibble. His eyes lit up and a rare smile crossed his lips. Hmm, this wall is delicious, he exclaimed. I'll just take one more bite, he murmured. One bite led to another, and another, and another, and the gluttonous king did not stop there. He kept eating and eating his own wall. Before long, only crumbs of cookie dough remained. The king clutched his belly. He could no longer move. A loud burp escaped his lips. Catalina smiled. She knew that would happen. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Her family arrived right on time for their visit. She gathered a fresh batch of her favorite cookies and ran into their arms. Life sure is sweet, declared Catalina. And so it was and so it is. And the king, too stuffed for his own good, never bothered anyone again. Thanks for listening to my book. I want you to know that its main message is that Black Lives Matter. Love is love. 
Feminism is for everyone. No human is illegal. Science is real. Be kind to everyone and all are welcome. Thank you.